Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to slowly start while the room, room is slowly filling up. Welcome to the last panel discussion of the annual foreign policy conference on high-tech wars. I know that we have a difficult task to fulfill because this is the panel right after the lunch break. And we also have the problematic task to summarize the conference and to dare an outlook into the future. I mean, I don't dare summarize such a facet-rich conference like this in a few words, but there's also another task. This panel also wants to critically focus on the issues that we have discussed in the last two days, and we are supposed to translate that into political action. How can political actors like Germany make sure that the development the application and the dissemination of difficult and dangerous technologies in the area of unmanned warfare can be banned or at least controlled. Is that a political option that is possible? I have the pleasure to discuss those things with four political speakers and panelists from different countries. My name is Henrik Rieke. I work for the German Society for Foreign Politics, and I am the chair for the coming 90 minutes. In the previous discussions, I had the impression that overall, the discussion on pros and cons of unmanned warfare is a, is a reflection of the general attitude towards the application of military violence. I mean, if war makes sense, then most technologies will also make sense. If not, then not. But we also have to ask ourselves, why is it necessary to talk about unmanned warfare, to talk about drones, and make sure that they are subject to arms control? Why should they be banned or at least limited? We have seen from the discussions that there is a whole host of different mechanisms that we can already recognize. However, they are difficult to understand and difficult to forecast. But based on the dissemination of those technologies, we have a change dynamics when it comes to warfare and international relations in general. I think that the discussion can never be finalized as to whether war and military violence become more likely because of unmanned weapon systems. But we have seen many escalation, examples that there is an escalation, not only between states, but also when it comes to non-state actors. The big concern that due to the dissemination of those technologies, more and more players will be able to act outside of international law and apply violence without being taken to court or held liable might result in a situation where international law is undermined. We have heard about many concerns that due to automation, uh, the battlefield might be dehumanized so that there is a reality where the ethical rules of human coexistence do no longer play a role. An 800-pound gorilla or a topic that was also sort of in the air here was that the driving force for the dissemination of those t technologies is no is not tactical or political or strategic, but it is arising from the enormous pressure due to the cooperation of industry, military, and other companies that will benefit from those technologies. So a technology which was in an infant stage a couple of years ago is now exponentially or rapidly developing, and those who have political responsibility uh, are offered expansions, updates, new possibilities, new possibilities to apply those technologies which seem desirable. So the pressure exerted by the industry, I mean, this is a billion euro market. This is definitely an issue that we should consider in our discussions. It is about controlling or regaining control over those mechanisms at the end of the day. So you have seen the guiding questions, what roles or what international conventions and international agreements do we need both as regards the use of unmanned systems within and outside of war, but also what about developments in the area of automation or miniature weapons? How can it be contained? What type of agreement would be feasible? Do we need strong norms, conventions, standards? Do we need conven control mechanisms or sanctions, or is that impossible? 
and what influence can political players like Germany exert? Germany that does not have this technology to a great extent yet. Can they exert influence on opinion formation processes with what does the German government think about it? I hope that we learn more about that. We have four panelists here who will make brief statements on those key questions. And afterwards, I will try to trigger sort of a, an interesting and hot debate. Agnieszka Brugger is the co-author of a petition of the Alliance 90, the Greens parliamentary group. No arms, no armed drones for Germany. A clear demand for arms control. Mika Zenko works for the Center for Preventive Action, Council on Foreign Relations, and he is somebody that the American president listens to because he conducted a study on the political categorization of the use of drones. And some of the aspects were also reflected in the speech on counterterrorism made by the president. Danny Rothschild is a former general of the Israeli Armed Forces and a founder of NetTax Security. This is a consultancy. And then we have Ambassador Rolf Nickel. He is the special commissioner of the federal government for disarmament and arms control. Now, I would like to ask Mrs. Brugger to start, and then we will have an American afterwards a German and then an Israeli. And hopefully we will get a nice image of political feasibility and influence. Thank you very much and hello to everybody. I can't claim that Minister of Defense de Maizière listens to me. And it is a great challenge really to say something on those big issues within seven minutes. Therefore, I can't delve into detail, but I would like to sketch some theses. Now, the, regard, the question regarding the necessity of regulations and rules has been posed various times, and I think we had different answers to that question. But that something needs to be done seems to be a consensus. And then the question of feasibility is at stake. This is sort of the second part of my statement. So first thing, what do we need to do? I would like to highlight three points. First one, I do think that we need an international ban of autonomous systems. I mean, you have to, of course, think about the exact formulations when it comes to those defense systems. You have to ask yourself, what would be a good framework? But all in all, I think we need a ban for the future. Second point, I'm sure that the existing disarmament regimes and arms control regimes have to be strengthened. They have to be further developed and they have to be extended. And third point, and that was also a topic of discussion today, it is the question of how to interpret international law when it comes to targeted killings. Because it is nice to have wonderful norms on paper, but if everybody interprets them differently, then we are in trouble and then we need to make change happen here. If I have a look at the drone debate in Germany, I'm always surprised that so many financial personnel resources, this is both political and also journalists, political people and journalists focus on that question, should Germany have armed drones or not? The other questions of disarmament and arms control, however, are hardly ever raised in Germany. And this is my first demand. I think that we also have to discuss those things much more intensively in civil society. Also, policymakers and journalists have to focus on those issues much more. Now, what are the difficulties? And I think they apply both to drones and also to cyber war. I think the first thing is, well, disarmament and arms control after its peak phase, after the end of the Cold War, sort of stagnated or started to stagnate. We have the existing regimes, conventional arms control in Europe, for instance, which is also stagnating. We have to ask ourselves, to what extent can those existing disarmament and arms control regimes, weapons register would be a buzzword here, can also include and cover and integrate other systems like drones. I mean, here we need to reach consensus at an international level, I think. We have the problem that those regimes focus a lot on quantity and the limitation and reduction of numbers of weapons. However, it is also about quality-driven issues, i.e., what capabilities are we talking about? And it's also linked to the question of what is the purpose of use? Why are they used? And what are the military strategies of the individual countries? And to create trust here is a big challenge, I think. 
But this definitely needs to be done. And here, transparency, verification, trust, building, interaction, exchange of information play a very crucial role here. But we also have the dual use problem. And we also have the question of what about non-state actors? It is already very difficult for the states to agree upon certain norms and standards, information obligations. So the question is, if that is already very difficult, what can we do when it comes to this level of non-state actors? How can this level become effective, sort of? And last point... Of course, we have many disarmament and arms control regimes that clearly focus on a specific area. This, of course, has a lot to do with the Cold War as well. But when it comes to, the, to those new military technologies, China plays a very big role. And here we don't have too many formats, too many safe standards that we can sort of use as a foundation for further discussion. A second point is the question of how is international law interpreted? On the one hand, we have the European version and interpretation. It was mentioned various times that targeted killings as executed by the United States are not in harmony with international law. They violate international law. However, I find it quite interesting to hear that the federal government, and Mr. Kress says th said this, does not respond to parliamentary inquiries asking what do you, the German government, do in order to criticize maybe certain positions and other countries. They remain very vague here, which is interesting because when it comes to domestic political debates here in Germany, I have observed that all those who want armed drones very clearly say we would never use them like the United States do. does. And we only want to do that in the context of international law. And here people suddenly become very concrete. So I'm asking myself, why don't they also focus on the other aspects? Now, here I would also like to come back to a statement that I have heard various times today. I would also like to question that statement a little bit. It comes down to the question of purchasing strike drones for or by the German army. That has not much to do with what the United States does. I mean, you can comment on that in detail. However, I would like to question that. You also have to see that Germany does not operate alone. We always operate in a multinational context together with our allies. And this is therefore very difficult to distinguish. Last point. Why do I believe that it is difficult when it comes to feasibility? What could be possible barriers? I mean, we also see that with other weapon systems. There is, of course, sort of a copying mechanism. Every country wants to prevail, military speaking. Everybody wants to sort of have a competitive advantage when it comes to those military technologies. And there is also the danger of an arms race. And there is not much readiness to agree on transparency rules and other regulations. So I think this is one of the biggest barriers. And it is always exciting to see that I, as a policymaker, are often asked when it comes to drones, will Germany be lagging behind? And it's not about capabilities for the German army. No, it is about the question of the industry. And the armament and the weapons companies and their future. And that is also something that you have already raised. And that is something we should also bear in mind when discussing those topics. It is feasible, I believe. Of course, it is very difficult. But those examples have already been mentioned today regarding biological, chemical weapons, where we also have this issue of dual use. So we see certain parallels there. And we have seen certain initiatives in this field. So it would be high time, I think, to really recognize the dangers of proliferation early on so that we apply international law correctly and that we act together. And here I would like to see the German government wake up as quickly as possible. Thank you, Ms. Brugger. Thank you, Mrs. Brugger. Seven minutes. You exactly complied with that time limit. Now, Mika Zenka would be the next one. You also highlighted or made different suggestions in your study as to what the U.S. administration could do or could, how could it could be a come, become a good role model. Posed in your study how America could be 
uh, role model, and so you can can um, um, contact to what, well, that, what Ms. That's a, uh, it assumes that American practice and policy is what you want to emulate, um, which is a dangerous proposition. Um, I would just start by saying that President Obama does not read my stuff. There's no evidence for that. Um, and I also work at a think tank which uh, does not represent or speak for the American government. I receive no money from the federal government, unfortunately. Um, and in many ways, uh, we are many com one of many competing voices who talk about this issue. Um, just to, to talk a little bit about some of the questions that were, that were put to us, first of all is this issue of you know, what role do policymakers have uh, to think through these issues. And the most important thing that everyone can take away from this is um, I spend a lot of time on Capitol Hill talking to policymakers, uh, senators and representatives and their staffs, and it's hard to emphasize the depths to which they are um, either unwilling to understand or just merely ignorant about how these technologies are used and developed, um, both in terms of their worst-case scenarios and their um, and just underplaying what, what effects they actually have. And if you could take one thing away from this, it would be uh, to reemphasize the need and the importance of uh, you know, connecting with, contacting, learning from your policymakers by asking them, what is your position on these technologies? Why is that your position? What do you, uh, how do you think they should be integrated into our broader foreign policy objectives? And when you put the questions to, in my case, senators and representatives and their staffs over and over again, it forces them to become educated. Um, and so that's... Uh, certainly the, the one thing you could, you could do, because you understand that policymakers take their guidance largely ideological from voices that they already respect. So if you're already a respected voices in this field, um, you might be listened to. If you're not, uh, it's harder to make, to make yourself known, but don't, certainly don't give up. Second, in the case of the United States, it's important that people um, separate what is reported and what is policy. Um, there are a series of Department of Defense uh, semi-related uh, or, or formal or informal studies which mention autonomous capabilities and unmanned systems. There are also uh, semi-connected to the U.S. government think tanks that report, up, report on these issues. But what somebody dreams up in the corner of the Pentagon is not necessarily what U.S. policy is. You know, there, there's, there's different ways to think about this. There's policy, there's doctrine, and then there's directives. Um, if you're looking for confirmation bias of worst-case scenarios about how fully autonomous lethal drones could be used, you can find it just about anywhere. If you're also looking for bias to suggest the alternative, which is it is officially U.S. policy that um, a, quote, a, figure will a finger will always be on the trigger uh, when, an armed, when an armed drone attacks, you can find that as well. And I would just say that within the, within the military, this is a very contested, this is a very contested issue. Uh, there are many people in futures concepts groups in the Air Force and in the J-8 and the J-9, which are the concept development people in the Pentagon, who are completely opposed to the notion of autonomous drones. Um, I've never met anyone at the colonel level or, or above who supports, uh, who supports these uh, being used within the U.S. Uh, uh, you, within the U.S. military, that doesn't mean that aren't, there aren't people thinking about it and working upon it, but it's important to distinct various people who have proposed things and what is policy um, also, on the issue of whether or not there should be international agreements to these, uh, I, I agree that this can happen. There's no reason there could not be an international covenant, uh, either likely to be informal, which uh, integrates the concerns of the lead actors in this case. It's the United States, Israel, uh, an EU consortium, uh, China, and to a lesser extent, Russia. And if you can get them on board and have some agreement upon what uh, fully autonomous lethal killing machines mean, uh, you could do that. But... There, there's not even an understanding what autonomous is because there is degrees of autonomy in all weapon systems today, including in U.S. Uh, armed drone capabilities. Um, and then, you know, the issue that was mentioned, which is the distinction between uh, autonomy for lethal strikes versus self-defense. Um, so there's a lot of sort of thinking through on these issues. My, my greatest concern right now is not uh, on fully autonomous military capabilities, is not drones. It's, it's in the cyber realm. Uh, there are a lot of contractors uh, and others who are working on um, I would say the, the cyber uh, espionage and attack attribution capability, the confidence in this is increasing rapidly uh, in the United States, especially in the U.S. government. And the perceptions that, that uh, U.S. officials can know where cyber attack emanates from is uh, something that has increased just in the last year. As one official told me, you know, we used to think we knew where a country attacked us. And then we got to the point where we knew the unit that attacked us. And now we know the desk where the, the attack originates from. And so one of the capabilities that are being developed now, which is um, 
a uh, autonomous res- uh, immediate response to the a perceived attack on a, on a network system that will send a direct denial of service attack against the IP address where it emanates from. And this is an autonomous cyber attack capability. It is, in a sense, more worrisome and more near-term than any autonomous drones will ever be. Uh, it's also something that no one's really discussing in any, in any serious way. Um, <clears throat> you know, one of the other points I'll just mention, this was in the, in the discussion I was at before, which was the, the connection between conflict and technology. Um, you know, last year, something like 525,000 people died from violence in the world. Of those, maybe 50,000 of them died in armed violence, which includes war, civil war, and terrorism. Of those 50,000 people, maybe 800 died from uh, drone attacks, of those 800, zero were by an autonomous drone, and zero were by a cyber attack. So if you were really interested in saving people's lives from uh, how you die from violence, it's largely criminal interpersonal violence. This is what causes the most immediate harm to people. Uh, these are not issues of international relations, but I think it's worth keeping that in perspective uh, when you talk about the futures of war, because I'm asked to talk about the future of war in lots of different scenarios, and as I always tell people, it will look a lot like the past, and it will look immediately a lot like the present. Um, so looking at the means of lethality today, I think are essential for understanding how they'll likely be applied in the near future. Um, and the final point, I'll, I'll, you know, we were asked, like, what can European governments, what can Germany do uh, about this? I can say in the case of the United States, um, you know, one of the things that, uh, with the exception of the Netherlands and Denmark, that has been, I would say, scandalous, was the European reaction over the last... Uh, 11 and a half years to U.S. Uh, targeted killing policies. Um, I spend, I'm in New York. I you know, talk to people at the various U.N. missions there, and there were no European governments who raised this in any setting with their U.S. counterparts. This does not happen in the embassies in, in Washington, D.C., at the Universal Periodic Review and the, at the Human Rights Council in Geneva. Again, Netherlands and Denmark, nobody else raised said a word about it. Meanwhile, the United States conducted something like 435 targeted killings, killing something like 3,500 people uh, in Pakistan, Yemen, and Somalia. Um, If you're opposed to the prospect of autonomous drones being used by the United States, Israel, China, Russia, at all, um, one place you could start is how the U.S. is behaving today. Uh, And if you're troubled by that, and you can imagine that different degrees of autonomy are integrated into lethal strikes, that should trouble you even more. Um, But don't overlook what's going on in the past and what's going on today. Thank you. Dankeschön. Wichtige Hinweise zum Kontext unserer Diskussion. Important remark on the context of the discussion. I'm going to hand the floor to Mr. Nickel now. You can use the rostrum here, please. You're a representative of the Foreign Ministry here, Commissioner for Disarmament and Arms Control. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to participate in this event today. It is quite straightforward that drones and armed systems have been discussed intensely over the past couple of months, and this is a good thing. And even cyber security has um, been drawn into public attention since Stux, uh, Stuxnet in 2010. What they, they all have in common is that technology leaps forward and that the importance of unmanned planes and the cyberspace increases. And let me just put up a few theses. Drones are launching systems. They're not weapons as such. Um, just like planes, they can be used for several purposes. The German army has been using unman- unarmed drones for intelligence purposes, serving the protection of our soldiers and of our allies in operations, the way our German parliament resolved upon it. And whenever drones are armed for their operation, the same rules apply, i.e. international law, the same rules as in any other type of um, warfare. So it has to correspond to humanitarian international law and civilian population must not be attacked in in an indiscriminate way. The federal government um, sees to it that the reporting standards are abided by according to the UN Weapons Register and to make this homologue, and we're doing the same thing for other areas of arms control, like in the CFE treaty and the Vienna document. The ABC 
conventions and other covenants are equally applied to manned and unmanned systems. But of course, other ethical and international law issues arise. How do you make sure that humans stay responsible and in charge of all decisions made in the context of drones? Armed systems must not become autonomous and independent. And our Federal Minister of Foreign Affairs said quite clearly that he didn't want humans to be excluded and that we are moving into a direction, into a direction of automated computer-controlled fighting operations. And this brings me to autonomous systems. I welcome this debate on the automization of armed systems. Human Rights Watch raised important issues here, and the Special Rapporteur of the United Nations, Christoph Heinz, made an important statement and uh, tabled an important report on it. Even for autonomous systems, international law sets limits. Armed operations must not be decided upon by machines. Humans must always stay in charge and in control and assume responsibility. If not, it would be against international law. A general ban of autonomous systems and, as Heinz says, a moratorium in the development um, still is confronted with difficulties, and this is what was mentioned today. Autonomous systems have dual-use properties. So a um, wealth of civilian or civil machines like lawnmowers and planes move autonomously, and a ban on technological development in general is not very realistic. Arms control agreements are successful mostly when there is a con consensus amongst states saying that weapons are obsolete. In systems that are under development and that offer advantages when protecting soldiers or in intelligence purposes, the resistance against international agreements is way higher. The call to further develop international law, including autonomous systems, has its risks. The existing standards apply regardless of the standards and of purchasing the weapon. The protection of civil society apply regardless of whether a fight is carried out with robots or with um, hand arms, and we don't want these standards to be watered down. What we need is a continuous debate in order to make for greater transparency in terms of procedures and criteria. The report tabled by Special Rapporteur Heinz gave a number of recommendations, amongst which the recommendation to develop guidelines by an international panel of experts. And his call upon strengthening humanitarian international law must only be seconded. Now, uh, talking about conventions to avoid targeted killings. Whether t a targeted killing corresponds with international law um, in the context of the use of drones cannot be generally responded to, but just knowing all the facts. The assessment depends on the context, and it depends especially on the fact whether it's an armed conflict or outside an armed conflict where it's used. So generally speaking, peace international law forbids uh, the killing of people in general, and the right or the law in an armed conflict allows for the killing of an enemy, and here humanitarian international law is the benchmark. In an armed uh, conflict, military enemies can also be killed outside the hostilities in a targeted way, according to international law. Targeted killings outside armed conflicts are not admissible. And according to the criterion of humanitarian international law, in armed conflicts, it depends on the length, the duration, and the intensity of facilities and the number and structure of the combatants. Another call for avoiding certain specific tactics like targeted killing and um, including this in international treaties seems hard to impose, even if it be desirable in humanitarian points of view. Operation tactics can hardly be delimited, and in terms of international law, it, they can hardly be con contained. And there's no precedence for this. And the exper experience of preventive measures in international law are not homogenous. Although there was a ban on the use of dazzlers, which was successful, but as opposed to that, we have the failure to try to put this on solid grounds in terms of international law. What seems to be successful is to follow the recommendation of the Heinz report and to elaborate recommendations by a panel of experts as to how human control over 
armed systems can be guaranteed. Just a few words on cybersecurity. The military use of cyber technology raises a number of similar issues. Cyber technology has the dual use um, property which it has in common with robots and um, limitations seem to be different in the cyber area. Traditional patterns of arms control don't apply and in the cyberspace we are confronted with a multitude of players. So along with um, cyber superpowers there is a number of states, hacker groups and individuals and what adds to it is the attribu attribution problematics. The persons mandating these attacks can hardly be identified. What does this result in? We have to increase and step up our protection measures and make our infrastructure robust against cyber attacks. Second, we need to create a universal framework for legal behavior in the cyberspace. And in the cyberspace, State behavior has to abide by the principles of the UN Charter. States uh, are to be held accountable for uh, the actions of individuals acting on their behalf. And as long as arms control doesn't apply, we have to build trust-building measures. And typically, this includes the exchange of information and the establishment of crisis communication channels. A government expert group established by the United Nations has tabled important recommendations to that end, and Germany was participating. As a common denominator and against the backdrop of predictable developments, I can see the need not to deal with tools only, but to devise strategies of settling conflict, creating a dialogue in transparency, and to build trust. These elements are all the more important, the more complex the field of future developments is. Thank you. As the last speaker, I'd like to ask Danny Rothschild to give his comments, maybe with a wealth of experience from your practical military work. Uh, I'm sitting in the last... Uh I'm sitting since uh, yesterday in uh, very, very interesting and for me very uh, stimulating uh, conference dealing with issues that uh, we started dealing with them with them only uh, lately. Now I I have no argument with those uh, of us which think and express it as someone did here that there is no need for an army and no need for a war. And uh, if there'll be no wars, then uh, innocent people are not going to be killed. I, I have no argue with them. I have no argue with with them because I think they are totally wrong. I have a big argument uh, with the people who think yes, we still need army because we still have uh, enemies, uh, but we have to limit uh, the modern technology. Uh, like we have not done with the technology which we were using until now uh, in the past. And a few words on the, uh, on the issue. Look, we, it's very difficult to forecast the future. The digital computing uh, was used uh, in the last uh, 50 years in... Uh, actually creating uh, our uh, technology. But the future is in the quant computing. That is the issue which will allow a real autonomous robo robots to work. And until today, uh, there are no autonomous robots in the war, in the war field. There are half, auto half autonomous a robot, which actually means those are robots. Will it be drones or other robots? And we are concentrating on drones, but in the uh, uh, battlefield there are a lot of other uh, autonom half-autonomous uh, machines, which in each of them, the intelligent decisions are taken by a human being. And in that sense... What they are doing is only being in a position to 
overcome some of the most problematic issue that issues that we were afraid of while using a conventional force. What are the issues that usually we are uh, afraid of? One is collateral damage. In the traditional war zone, there was a huge collateral damage. You are sending an F-16 to the air uh, to bomb a target, and the collateral damage which is around it and the amount of innocent people which uh, are killed or hurt is enormous. So that's one of the things that the uh, robots mainly the drones, have solved most of the problems because there is a very, very little collateral damage when using uh, drones, and they become more and more sophisticated as time passes, and the amount of collateral damage is reduced almost to, uh, to nil. And the second thing is to kill innocent people. Look what we are doing. In the, uh, we are now coming and standing up against robots. We haven't done it when we dealt with tanks, with infantry battalions, with a battlefield, which was not able, was not in a position to make a distinction. Who is innocent and who is not innocent? For the first time in the battlefield, robots can make a distinction. Who is innocent and who is not innocent? With a very, very fine accuracy, and as time passes, it becomes more and more uh, accurate. Having said that, I believe that the public debate is important. It's much more important than political debate between politicians and, and states, because only public debate can bottom up, put pressure on decision makers uh, uh, on that issue and can bring a change. I can tell you from, my, from our experience in Israel, public debate in Israel about the use of uh, attack uh, drones brought to it that the level of approval of an operation if in the past it was at the uh, hand of a commander in the field, it's today going through six levels of approvals ended with the political level, mostly defense minister, sometimes even prime minister. So that's what the public debate brought uh, uh, in that sense, and I think it's, uh, it's very uh, important. One last word about international treaties, agreement, and, and uh, convention. I think they are intact. We have to deal with them. We have to prepare them. Will, will it be uh, uh, in the UN? Will it be in the US, Germany, Europe, wherever? But we have to realize that, in, in a sense, we are playing with ourselves. Because on the other side... I'm not sure that Al-Qaeda or any other terror organization will sign that, that treaty. So we can bother ourselves, we can bring to it that we, because of our moral, will reach a degree of understanding of what is right and what is wrong, but I'm not sure that we'll find the other side which will be willing and able to sign uh, those agreements. Thank you. Thank you, Rothschild. Thank you, Mr. Rothschild. I'd like to thank you for your concise and brief introductory remarks. And now I'd like to address some questions to you to look at whether we can maybe outline the contradictions a bit more. I had the impression that Ms. Brugger and Mr. Nickel pleaded for the same cause, but I thought that Ms. Brugger was more optimistic when it comes to the options 
and the options of finding a consensus when it comes to arms control. She was more optimistic than you, Mr. Nicol. I thought that you were a bit more committed, uh, well, not committed, but more optimistic when it comes to this beautiful new agenda. But I realize that you have some doubts because of your practical work. Now I'm asking the two of you, what would be the opposing interests of those who own the technology and further develop it and the others that don't own it when it comes to thresholds like uh, the use of autonomous weapons. I mean, are there any overlaps of interests? Is there a gray area that we can work with, Ms. Brugger? Well, maybe Ambassador Nickel is a little bit more optimistic because he has to negotiate things in detail and he's aware of all the barriers. As I told you, I mentioned some of the difficulties and I don't believe that this is a short process that will lead to an easy consensus, but it, there won't be any consensus if different players and you had Germany has to be called upon, don't embark on one path and trigger the discussion and exert more pressure than our current government does, because I would contradict the statement, but of course I share the vision of a world without weapons and without war, and who wouldn't, and this would be desirable, but of course we're far off, far away from that, but I do believe that even in the face of recent technological developments, we have to wonder what the implications are. And we witnessed it in other types of weapons that they changed the way of warfare. And for instance, in landmines and nuclear weapons, which is the worst thing that humans have ever developed. And returning or revising such a development and counteracting it is something very difficult that can hardly be done. And now we have the opportunity to look ahead and to anticipate things, to um, contain some undesirable developments, because I think that the question of proliferation is underestimated at present, where each and every state looks at how it can use its own military capacities to its own benefit. But the question about as to what about a consensus amongst the states that own the arms before containing limits? I think this is a decisive question we have to raise today and not tomorrow or later. Is on? Yeah, okay. Okay. Well, I would want to shed light on three topics uh, why we are of different opinion. Mrs. Brugger, you are part of the opposition. Secondly, she is much younger than myself. And thirdly, she, or I am a practitioner who, in fact, as you said it, has to negotiate those things. No, but seriously, I think we have to really not underestimate the interests that are sort of colliding here. And it has become clear here on the panel what special interests are at stake and what advantages some states might enjoy or some states see when it comes to those things. Rothschild, Mr. Rothschild clearly sketched that. And I also tried in my intervention to highlight some of those aspects. So you have to f bear in mind that we have colliding interests at stake here. Now, if you want to do arms control and if you observe arms control over a longer period of time, then I think that the decisive point is when is arms control successful? It is successful if certain systems become obsolete. Nuclear weapons, for instance, where you see that conventional weapons have so become so strong that you don't need nuclear weapons anymore, so they become obsolete to a certain degree. Or if certain things are overestimated in their value. This, for instance, applies humanitarian arms control, landmines, etc., because we have seen totally different developments there. Here, arms control has been very successful. Where it was not successful in the past is when it comes to the containment of new technological developments. In the Space Convention, 
at an early stage where nobody was able to do anything, certain containment has been or was achieved. But when it comes to new to other new technological developments, it was very difficult because there were clear interests from the industry and also from the political side. However, rest assured, I am not a sleeping beauty here. I don't have to wake up like sleeping beauty here. I mean, the German government at the moment tries to make sure, well, in some areas, drones are already prohibited equipping them with chemical or biological weapons. That has already banned. So we try to foster this weapons register. We try to create transparency. By the way, there's a lot of resistance to that. We also try that with the SFE treaty, CFE treaty, sorry. And it is about transparency instruments because CFE standards are so high that there is no problem. But... In this context, we see already major problems, Not never mind containment. So having said that, I believe that we should now make concrete steps. The Heinz report, for instance, which talks about the establishment of an expert group. Why can't we, like with cyber, found a group of experts that deals with those problems and that tries to get the different stakeholders on board. I think these would be first concrete steps that we could make and that we should make in order to make progress. Let me warn you of making the fifth or sixth step before the first one. Thank you. A question to Mr. Zenko and Mr. Rothschild. Also with regards to the interests that need to be seen in the context of a convention on unmanned weapon system. Mr. Zenko, in your study, you suggest or you argue that the U.S. is rather hesitant when it comes or should be rather hesitant when it comes to using drones because they can be sort of a moral role model. Are you really optimistic that the United States, based on this perspective, can do away or can do without the excessive use of drones and is rather careful when it comes to the further development automation of those systems. Do you think that this would be feasible if other states didn't do that? Would the U.S. go too far if other states like China or, for instance, also Israel uh, became a front runner on this market? Would that be okay for the U.S.? And question to Mr. Rothschild, what about the moral role model? If, let's say, that different countries like the U.S. and Germany said, we don't want that, we consider this to be too dangerous, would the Israeli government be impressed by that? Um, I think I got it. I, I'll, I'll go first and just say that um, c counting on the United States to be the uh, role model for world behavior is uh, a fool's errand, and it's not one that you should be doing. Uh, similarly, you know, you should not be looking to only establish international bodies like the United Nations or the European Union as the place to begin discussions on conventions uh, of any sorts of um, reductions on arms uses. Um, in the United States, it's simply a political fight. I mean, it's a contested idea about how these systems could be used. And the way, whether they're used in any greater, um, uh, um, either autonomous or strike in any greater numbers, or in a wider scope, will have simply to do whether or not there is the perception, the belief that there are that it fulfills a needed military mission. Right now, the U.S. is not investing uh, significantly. Well, actually, UAV spending is going down in the Air Force and the Navy in the next uh, five years because we're running out of money like everyone else. Um, and because we're running out of money, we're not pursuing uh, some of the more uh, out-of-the-box uh, projects that lots of people in the, in the military would like to, would like to, um, would like to pursue. But the U.S. will not uh, uh, introduce autonomous, be the first country, I believe, to introduce autonomous uh, drones uh, for strike purposes in the world until there's a specific military mission which current capabilities do not meet are used. And whether China or Russia or Israel or anyone else does it first, I don't think necessarily plays plays a uh, impact on their decision making. I have to answer your question uh... Certainly Israel listens to uh, the United States and Europe and others. Having said that, Israel is in a totally different situation. Uh, we have threats that we have to deal with uh, on a daily basis. We even uh, issued uh, 
uh, something which is called uh, in our legal system a ticking bomb, which actually means if you have a piece of information that a bomb is ticking, a bomb ticking can be someone which went out of his house in order to commit suicide in a bus in Tel Aviv or somewhere else. And I'm not sure that uh, we are going to listen to anybody which will tell us not to, uh, not to attack it. So there is a lot of white, there's a lot of black, but there's gray areas uh, in between. And, and everything has to be uh, dealt with, with uh, a lot of sense, with a lot of uh, um, uh, sensitivity. Uh, but in the end of the day, uh, every country has the right to defend itself and to defend its citizens. And in that sense, everything uh, should be done. Thank you. Um, I think we have uh, 30 minutes for questions and answers now. And therefore, I would now like to open the discussion to end with the audience. Let's look around. There's one question over here. Who else would like to pose a question? I have a question to Mr. Rothschild. Mr. Rothschild, we know the UN blue helmets and we know the respective mission. Okay, now, would it also be possible for you to have something like an armed drone operation in the Middle East under the United Nations umbrella, something like a blue helmet operation so could you imagine that this could be a moderation tool in the Middle East under the umbrella of the United Nations? I mean, there could be quite a lot of positive effects regarding personal resources, regarding costs and financial resources, and many security issues could also be solved with that. And for the Europeans, there might also be certain peace aspects so that with neighboring countries, the alleged or real dangers could be controlled a little better. And this also brings me to what Mr. Nickel said, so that you have sort of an expert group at different levels. This is what he suggested. So an expert group that can also make input to that UN operation. Is that feasible or is it too theoretical? You were not referring to the use of unmanned systems in war, were you? Yeah, yeah, unmanned armed systems. Yes, exactly. Okay, further questions? Then... To complete the round, let me pose a question to Mr. Brugger, Mrs. Brugger, because the motion that you tabled clearly says that the federal government should not purchase armed drones. And, of course, the counter-argument would be that once you have decided that German soldiers are part of a mission or operation that can also be in war situations, what would you say then? I mean, if people say that it is ethical, it is imperative that soldiers, German soldiers, are equipped perfectly, so why would you deny that technology? It is an argument that Mr. Rothschild also mentioned. I would like Mr. Rothschild to start. The question was, uh, can the Blue Helmets, the UN, uh, work in the Middle East uh, in order to... Uh, solve moral issues uh, by using uh, standards of the UN. Do you want to see German soldiers? What is the UN? The UN is consists of uh, soldiers from all over the world. So if you're asking German uh, soldiers to uh, be, say, in Gaza or in the Golan Heights in Syria and... Uh, Ex exercising uh, German rules in the Golan Heights, 
I'm afraid it will be a very, very problematic issue for Germany. The lady is not using a microphone. She, she has not been using a microphone. I wanted to shed on an analogy, the analogy of the blue helmets when it comes to the use of drones for reconnaissance and control in this Middle Eastern area. So no German troops, no German soldiers on the ground in the Middle East. Just the use of drones as a reconnaissance instrument. Aha, so the use of drones under the command of Blue Helmets, under the command of the United Nations in the Middle East? I don't care. I don't care. This is just a unit as an alliance of governments, of experts that have this drone use in the Middle East. Aha, so an international command for the use of drones. The logic behind it. So uh, uh, I'm afraid maybe it's me, it's not you. Well, Mr. Nickel, let me clarify one thing. I didn't want to call you the sleeping beauty, but rather your boss, which is Minister Westerwelle. In your presentation, you gave some nice reasons. You said that targeted killings outside of armed conflicts, according to the belief of the federal government, is against international law. But still... I'm asking myself, why do we then not communicate that to our partners in the United States? Why do we leave that question open? Why don't we critically talk with them about it? But when it comes to the protection of soldiers, we had long and lengthy discussions in our parliamentary group, also regarding the question of armed drones for the German army. And on the first side, I would say that the protection of soldiers is not sufficient an argument or it is actually an argument that you should not sweep under the carpet. And I think that many colleagues share that, so that the question of foreign missions needs to be answered from different perspectives. And here we need, of course, a parliamentary resolution. And you intensively deal with the details, and it is a matter of conscience, and it is a very emotional matter. On the other hand, I also have to say that... Many emotions are stirred here. If I have a look at some conservative politicians, because I usually consider all the arguments, and I in the end said no to armed drones for the German army, and they said, oh, you are not interested in the protection of soldiers. And if I hear those arguments, I really get angry because, I mean, these people say that we need to delay the purchase of armed vehicles although we all know that this would have been absolutely important for protecting our people in Afghanistan. However, you have to ask the question why or what consequences this would have. What dangers do those technologies imply? Do you want Germany to become part of this arms race or would it be better and more credible with regards to the risks and dangers, with regards to the fact that due to the proliferation of those new technologies, international law has been hollowed out and undermined to a great extent. Wouldn't it be better to do without armed drones and not buy them? And I think here it is very important to mention the following. If you want to buy a new weapon system, then you need clear security policy reasoning why you need those systems. And you also need to consider the peace policy arguments. And de Maizière, the Minister of Defense, s s clearly owes us re re um, respective reasons. They say, okay, the Afghanistan mandate will finish in 2014. But I often asked how often were armed drones used in Afghanistan, and there were only two cases. And it was not even a threat to the soldiers. So I would like to hear concrete operational scenarios for what we need those drones. And I think you also need to consider all the other arguments and aspects when you discuss this. Thank you very much. I don't see everybody of you. I don't have any drones here that help me detect you. But I can see that a lady over there wants to pose a question. So please. Okay. My name is Juliane Katharina Rautenberg. Unfortunately... Unfortunately, I only listened in the last 20, 30 minutes, 
I didn't listen to the rest. I mean, we talked about the role model function here, and I found this very interesting, whether other countries couldn't be a role model by rejecting those things. And then it was said that the United States is believing in its mission, believes in the military mission. I think you can believe in God, but not in a military mission. And then it was said that based on this belief, those things should not be negotiated in a United Nations context. It is really a pity because this is actually the idea, or that was the idea, why the United Nations were formed. And then on Israel, it was said that Israel sees itself as an exceptional case, an individual case, and feels threatened the whole time and is thus not bound to the consensus of the United Nations. That was just a statement. Why do we have the United Nations if we don't negotiate those issues there? Okay, any further claims for the floor? To the entire panel, you were talking about containing high-tech weapons, and you're talking mostly about state actors. How would you see the development that non-state armed groups are increasingly using drones like Hezbollah and not even drones, but... I just was at the prior panel about cyber warfare, how non-state actors are actually de developing cyber, war cyber warfare capabilities. How would you contain them if you talk about international humanitarian law? Okay, so the question was, how can non-state actors be included in this discussion? How can we make sure that non-state actors do not purchase those weapons systems? Karin Grischek, I have a question to Mr. Nickel, and it's actually the same question that Mr. Zenko raised in the beginning, i.e., why the European response to the U.S. policy of targeted killing is so scandalous or has been so scandalous because there has been zero reaction. Maybe Mr. Nickel can give us some background information. Maybe you can shed some more light on this abstention, on this silence, on this zero reaction. There hasn't been a reaction for many years. Thank you. Somebody in the front. Okay, let us close this round. Unfortunately, I'm a little disappointed by what you, Mrs. Berger, said. The alleged protection of soldiers is something that you obviously care about. This is at least what you said. But I don't think that you really care about the protection of soldiers because the arguments that you tabled here are totally absurd. And the idea that General Rothschild mentioned, i.e. that it is a contradiction to say that we have armed forces, use them in a democratic, legitimate way in or four piece, but then we don't equip them perfectly. I mean, let us go through some of the arguments. You said that there were only two cases where armed drones were demanded from allies. Of course, if you don't have this means, you cannot demand it. And it contradicts any alliance policy to demand those means from allies if you could purchase them the yourself. It would be like saying, okay, we sent our soldiers to Afghanistan. Don't equip them with vests and then ask the French or the Americans to give us their vests. I mean, this is the logic of your argument. Second point. To really mention concrete scenarios, I mean, the future is unclear, and that has been said various times in the last two days. And you now expect that with regards to war and conflict, the future can be forecast in detail. But that is totally unrealistic, and it shows me that you need further training and information with regards to the understanding of war. Could you maybe tell us who you are? Please introduce yourself. I didn't want to repeat myself. IFSH in Hamburg. This is what I, the institution I work for. Okay, let's start with Mr. Zenko and with uh, Rothschild. First question went to Mr. Nickel and then Mrs. Brugger. And um, uh, I know someone mentioned my statement that there was a belief of military missions. 
um, and you can't believe in them. People who plan and execute and authorize the use of military force do. Uh, they have a theory for how this can be employed, and that's how they base their uh, that's how they base their practices. Um, I, I would separate that statement from my own personal belief, which is, you know, uh, much of my work is uh, focused on, you know, the, the notion that military force uh, is an acceptable way for states to resolve their disputes is a disease. And if you're really interested in preventing the use of drones, autonomous or cyber, uh, you have to go at the uh, root cause of this perception, which is the idea that this is an acceptable way to do things. Um, this is distinct from protecting soldiers in the field. This is distinct from taking time bomb scenarios. Uh, but this is what I spend a lot of my time uh, doing, which is looking at um, uh, proposals for using military force and trying to understand what their intended consequences and causes are. And when you spend your career doing that, you find there's not many enduring solutions to problems anywhere in the world with uh, using military force. The question was uh, about non-state actors, and I think that's the biggest problem that one has when dealing with international treaties and, uh, and agreement, because they are not uh, part of it and they are not going to be part of it. You mentioned Hezbollah, you mentioned Hamas, and I can tell you a list of uh, quite a bit of such organization, which I'm not sure are going to sign on any of those treaties uh, or be members of the UN. Only in Syria today there are 34 extreme groups which, do not, which are not Syrians. The reason that they are there is to lay a hand on the uh, weapons arsenal of the Syrians. Once they'll do it, the problem is not going to be Israel, the problem is going to be Europe. And anyone which is naive enough to think that uh, it will stop somewhere in, in the border of the Middle East uh, will, will be probably proven mistaken. So we have to think to look two, five, ten years ahead because the weapons that we are dealing with today, that's the time which it takes to them to develop them, to integrate them, to find the right way to use them, including international treaties, including moral uh, restrictions on ourselves, not because someone demanded it for, from us. But that's exactly why we have to look two, five, ten years ahead uh, today in order to uh, be uh, uh, capable of dealing with those issues when they'll come. Henneke? Ja, es war eine Reihe von Fragen, die sich... There have been a number of questions addressed to me. So for a start, let me say that the notion that the United States could be a role model for us is a concept that is completely foreign and alien to our German government. We are allies in an alliance... But this is not why the U.S. are a role model for us, to the contrary so, because we've demonstrated on numerous occasions that we don't have a common denominator in many respects, which is also applicable to targeted killings. And the mere fact or the notion that things are also divulged to the public, well, it doesn't mean that things are not being talked about also in interstate panel. So the international law advisor of the states has traveled to Germany recently, and these uh, things are being discussed. And the fact that the American president felt called upon to explain his drone policy, well, maybe not to the extent that we would have wished for, we would have wanted more, is traced to be traced back to the fact that the allies in Germany have exerted pressure on the U.S. So the fact that things are not uh, written about in articles every day doesn't don't mean that we don't talk about these things in intergovernmental relations. Second, dealing with things within the framework of the United Nations. I'm deeply convinced that this topic has to be dealt with in particular there in the United Nations. And I mentioned the UN Weapons Registry. So as to see to it that Uh, drones become a category there, and we have to try to establish an expert panel in the UN where these, these issues can be discussed. It's not about the question as to 
the need to do something, but we have to do something that we believe can be successful. Nobody wants to be associated with initiatives that then blocks uh, further developments for years and backfires. So let us just sort out these issues in an expert group within the United Nations before trying to take a common stance to um, draw conclusions from it. And it's important that even states that use drones in particular are part of that expert group. So uh, an expert group without the U.S. and Israel is not really bound to be successful. So we need to pursue this discussion, and I think the United States seems to be a decent organization within which this debate can actually be going on. And then picking up on non-state actors. So first and foremost, it's about developing exports control so that these technologies, these high technologies, don't fall into the hands of these people. So here there is a major need for further development. But what is even worse is what is going on in the cyber space. And you mentioned it. I mean, because of the low entry prerequisites and conditions, there are many options for hacker groups to become active. And here as well, the principle of responsibility of the states has to be further developed. So states are in charge and is often responsible for what is going on on their territory, which means that when certain hacker activities take place in a state and that have consequences in other states, this state of origin has to contain the activities, if not the state has to be held accountable for it in terms of international law. We've got attribution problems that goes without saying, but it's not as if we didn't know where certain things come from. I mean, there are possibilities to detect this, and especially the expert group, the intergovernmental expert, expert group that tabled this report recently has been groundbreaking, and we should further embark on this path. There are two more things that I was going to bring in the discussion. At the end of the day, it's all about technology. And technology is a means to an end. So if we fight for a more peaceful world, we will have to devise the right strategies and start with the strategies uh, in terms of questions of involving states and creating dialogue and transparency in general, creating trust. These are the things that we have to start from. An isolated discussion about technological developments is not sufficient for arms control, to my mind. And when it comes to operational tactics displayed by Germany, it seems to be important to me that we are very careful about the rules of engagement that apply to operations abroad and that are tabled to the German parliament and where the German parliament would then have to take the necessary measures and take the necessary decisions to sort out things. Ms. Brugger? Well, in Afghanistan, we have operations of the Americans that take place beyond the ISAF mandate, but also in territories where the German army is present. So you cannot easily dissociate one thing from the other. But getting back to the question of Mr. Schmidt, you disappointed me as well. Well, or you did not disappoint me because I expected you to raise this question. It's not the first argument we're having. But I am disappointed, though, because I don't understand your argument that uh, you should acquire each and every military skill. And I'm happy that y you're not in charge of procurement policy of the federal government because, I mean, we can start with cost issues, but of course we also have to do something else. And I think this is a big mistake that happened in the reform of our German army. We have to wonder what uh, the army is used for, what are its objectives and what is the conclusion to be drawn from the Afghanistan operation. I don't have the feeling that this happened. My argument was that 
uh, we don't need any drones because we can always get back to the Americans. This was not what I meant. But you always pretend as if in the Afghanistan operations and by way of the use of armed drones, soldiers could have been protected. But when you look at the scenarios precisely, then they're not that close at hand as, for instance, in the case of armored vehicles. And it's difficult to take the Afghanistan operation in a very special scenario where there's a large presence of ground troops as well, to take this as an example, because I don't believe that this will be the operation of the future. And, well, this is not the way it's being discussed in Berlin. So you can't take this operation as a basis to justify the acquisition of such a weapon system if, on the other hand, you can see the dangers that arise from proliferation when it comes to lowering the threshold of inhibition for the use of military force that should be critically discussed. So I think these things cannot just be... Um, neglected and say, well, we need any military equipment that we can get hold of. I think we have to intensely deal with that. And when you buy a weapon system, you have to justify clearly what you need it for and what the purpose of it is. And I don't see that right now. Thank you. Add that n nothing would make the United States government happier than if Germany bought a lot of armed drones and strategic airlift and command and control and in-air refueling and sent them all to Afghanistan, and you agreed to stay until 2023 when the United States is scheduled to stay too. So please. Komisch, hier gab es jetzt gerade keinen Applaus. Strange. There was no round of applause for that comment, strangely enough. Are there any questions for the last round? So for the final round, I would like to raise one question, question to everybody. I expressed a concern that the driving force behind the development of this drone discussion was the rapid progress in research and development that is carried by a strongly competitive industry with lobbying capacities. My question to you, do you believe that policymakers still have control over that, that policymakers and militaries are the real driving force behind all of this when it comes to the continuation of drone procurement, not drug procurement, but drone procurement. That was a lapsus of my side. Well, I have the feeling that you can also become addicted to this technology. I'm repeating the question. So are policymakers and military still the driving forces behind acquisition of unmanned systems and how they further developed and how they're controlled? Ms. Brugger. Well, in the end, it's always policymakers that decide upon it. Um, they take the budgetary relevant decisions that are tabled to the parliament. But what I said in my initial statement, this um, driving force of technological development is tangible and palpable. But when thinking about whether the German army should dispose of armed drones, well, I wouldn't first go to an armament company and ask them because I'm quite sure what the answer would be. And I'm not even talking about the Eurohawk here. But I do feel that... We should talk to the soldiers and to the troops here and discuss these things. But another thing should be done, which is done too little. We should also look into the current peace expertise um, of peace research, just because we've got many renowned institutions that work on this issue, and look at what are the dangers they're pointing to. And you realize that in the public debate and in parliamentary debates, when journalists ask twice, that then these issues are discussed little, i.e., how do you contain the dangers, how do you create limits and containment, and I'd wish for a greater role to be given to this in decision-making and in the public discussion. And I think it's not only policymakers that have a role to play here, but it's especially civil society that has responsibility. In Germany, we've got too little a debate about difficult questions of foreign and security policy. It's the, this year, the Pentagon's budget will be $633 billion of that, about $10 billion will be spent on drones. Uh, so if I'm an arms manufacturer, uh, this is nothing for me. Uh, this is pennies. In fact, Lockheed, Lockheed Martin, which is the largest weapons dealer in the world, makes far more money uh, servicing healthcare contracts than it does on drones, and it's the fastest growth industry for, for most people in, in this world. So 
they don't have undue influence on this particular technology on Capitol Hill or within the administration. They have undue influence on a lot of other procurement decisions where the real money is made. Uh, and if you're really interested in you know, how they influence things uh, in Washington, that's where you look, not necessarily in drones. Okay. Table two. Well, it's a little bit different in Israel. Uh, usually the uh, politician, the way they control those things out through the budget All the rest is done by the needs, the needs of the uh, military forces, which is going to the industry, and the industry comes with a solution. And that's why we have so many high-tech uh, uh, industry, and uh, as, as some people call a startup nation, then... Uh, the military or the defense uh, establishment is checking it, and if it's, it meets the needs, uh, it goes back to the politician, which are setting set of rules of yes and no uh, in order to procure it or not. So there's very little room for lobby, uh, much more uh, room for industry and needs. Anika? Mr. Nickel, of course, there are economic interests that can be expressed in these mechanisms in Germany, but I share the opinion of Ms. Brugger. The, polit the political control of these things is upon policymakers, so it's all down to the German parliament that uh, deliberates on the budget and has to adopt the budget. And in my case, well, I've never received any lobbyists that would have come to talk to me. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank the four panelists for their input and for their contribution to this Q&A session. Let me thank you for your attention and your participation. I do not want to summarize what we've been saying here, but I'm not no more optimistic now when it comes to the future of disarmament policies to contain this technology of unmanned warfare. But I do believe that um, in the field of existing arms control tools, there is a great deal of options and opportunities that are not yet been that are not yet fully tapped. And I think we'll be discussing for a while about this, and I'm handing the floor to Mr. Ensker, who would like to end the conference. Yes, exactly. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, so please allow the organizer to end with three sentences to wrap up this conference on high-tech wars, our foreign policy meeting of the year. As was said yesterday, Heinrich Böll Stiftung organized this conference on high-tech wars, making the attempt to enter into a complex issue, field of tension. And here, the Green Party really doesn't have a home match here, but we try to fill some information gaps and we try to contribute to make this debate more rational. This debate is about to start in Germany and it's going to become even more emotional in the future and we hope to have contributed to this debate. So if we, were, if we are successful in giving you some food for thought for further forming your opinion on this hot topic, we'd be very happy about that. Because when it comes to questions of war and peace, as Mr. Fuchs said yesterday, we need a well-informed public. And above all, we need an intense public debate. Thirdly, my third sentence. If this annual meeting helped in setting the important orientations in the political arena in Berlin and making them maybe more clear and giving them more inspiration, then we'd be even more happy. But this is going to show in the future. We'll have to wait and see. Dear friends, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, let me extend my gratitude to you. On behalf of the Heinrich Böll Foundation, let me thank all the panelists who found their way here. Let me thank the moderators and chairs of the discussions. Let me thank, of course, maybe in particular the persons that are often working invisibly behind the scenes who have contributed to the success of this conference. Let me thank the colleagues um, from 
technique, technology, the conference office, catering, you haven't had an easy job in organizing this annual meeting and you've been working under very unusual conditions like weather conditions. And in the very beginning of the final round, somebody told me, Ms. Jenska, your organization works perfectly and I'd like to pass on this compliment to the many colleagues working behind the scenes. And my thanks in the end goes to the interpreters also maybe on your behalf who didn't have an easy task either. And I would like to thank all of you for your patience, for bearing with us, and I'd like to thank you for your constructive participation. Have a safe trip home and stay loyal to the Heinrich Böll Foundation. All the best to you. And please hand in the questionnaires for evaluation at the conference desk. Thank you.